Hi there, everyone. Welcome to uh, Believe in Bills. Adam Benini, WGRZ TV, Sports Talk Live, Buffalo, Sal Mayorana, Rochester Democrat, and Chronicle. And with us for the second time this season, uh, a face and a name that uh, a lot of Bills fans will be very familiar with, former offensive lineman Jerry Ostrowski. Jerry, thanks for coming back. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Not a problem. Just uh, enjoying the lovely weather down here in Tulsa. Always Jerry Ostrowski tying Vic Carucci for the most appearances on Believe That's in right. Bills. Well, I'm trying it's to. Get, I, I want to be. I want to be the Steve Martin of this show. I want to <laughs> yeah. have the most appearances. You know, more so than Alec Baldwin. <laughs> well, you've got plenty of appearances, by the way, with Overreaction <laughs> Buffalo, also powered by Believe, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. A lot of Bills takes, and we uh, love hearing from you. Uh, the inside knowledge that you bring, and so. I think when last we spoke, it might have been before the Texans game or somewhere around there. Yeah. I might be a little bit off, but there were there were more questions than answers, Jerry, about this football team. And in terms of answers, they appear to have found one in Amari Cooper at wide receiver. What's your take on what he brings to the team? Um, obviously, I mean, after this weekend, he's pretty much as advertised, right? I mean, this is a guy that plays well against man coverage. Uh, he plays well in the 10 to 20 and 20 and above route tree area. Um, they need a guy that can get downfield and stretch some things. And I think when you bring a guy in like Cooper at a, as a as a 10 year vet, I know they got a few guys in that room that have some that have some you know seniority or some years under them, but they don't have the success and that pedigree like Cooper has. And I look for him to actually bring a bit of leadership to that room, you know, get Keon Coleman along, help uh, with the maturation process of Shakir uh, as he continues to emerge as a, as a very, um, you know, reliable receiver in the NFL. So, you know, they come right out. Um, he, he scores the touchdown. Now, obviously, he has a drop on the third and two, which you don't want to see. But I, I just I, – I kind of wrote it off as I don't think Josh – necessarily probably throws the easiest ball to catch in the NFL. I mean, the thing's coming at you, you know, with a, a lot of velocity. I don't think it's that, you know, that feathery pass that you might get from a Rodgers or some of these other guys. So I'll write that off as uh, first game experience. But obviously he stepped up after that. But as advertised, man, I mean, this uh, a great, great grab by Bean. I mean, not only do you get a veteran guy that's, you know, that's that's reliable and makes plays, you got him at 800,000 bucks. I mean, what, yeah. what can you be mad about? Yeah, I mean, that, that is the perfect transaction, right? Right. <laughs> I mean, his contract was so perfectly easy to fit into the into a salary cap that the Bills don't have much room to begin with. So they're basically getting this guy for free through the end of the year. Meanwhile, the Jets are paying Devontae Adams how many millions of dollars to be two and five so far. Right. Um, so, yeah, it looks great for the Bills. Jerry, I want to ask you, because you talked about leadership. You know, I, I talked to him. Uh, I talked to Cooper Lat, what we all did at the uh, – he had a little presser um, on Wednesday – and we talked to him, and you can just tell guy is really quiet, soft-spoken. Yes. Uh, I wasn't sure what to expect from him. I figured, you know, guy who went to Alabama, he might have some chops to him and played in Va- or played with the Raiders, played with the Cowboys. He was much different than I, than I anticipated. So with that type of personality, do you think that he can jump right in and be a leader joining a team here in the middle of October? Oh, I think definitely. Um, we saw what happened as far as team chemistry, especially on the offensive side of the ball, when you had that alpha at that position, right? Didn't really end very well. Um, you know, in a day and age where coaches are so, you know, they want to pre- they want to preach juice, free juice. So it's all about the juice, energy. You know, it. There are there are other forms of leadership. I know it's hard for some of these guys to understand, but a guy like Cooper that shows up. I mean, obviously puts the time in to learn the playbook well enough to be effective on Sunday after being there for a few days. He doesn't have to be loud. He doesn't have to be a vocal guy. He works hard. He shows his work ethic, and that's enough. And I think there's a very good blend. When you you have good leadership, you have a blend of a bunch of different guys. It's not just a bunch of rah-rah dudes. You know, you've got those guys. But you need that solid veteran leadership like he brings and those guys are going to see what he does, and they're going to try to emulate it because he's successful. I want to talk about that, the kind of the trickle-down effect to the rest of the receiving core. Just a quick word from the sponsor here. Bet Online is the world's most trusted betting platform and your number one source for everything football. Head to the website today to get under the action. Bet Online, the game starts here. Uh, Jerry, we talked about the limitations in terms of the explosiveness in this passing game when we had you on earlier this season. We had Phil Sims on 
uh, last week, and he had an interesting take on this. And from from where I sit, and I think Sal agrees with this, not only does Cooper add the you know a guy who can take the top off a of defense that type of dimension, but he allows other members of this receiving core to kind of get into roles that are more suited to their skill yeah. set. You know, I yeah. think of a guy like a, a rookie, like, you know, Keon Coleman right. is more of a Gabe Davis type replacement, right? A Khalil Shakir, outstanding, does his best work as a slot receiver. You know, Dalton Kincaid, we saw uh, more from him this last game in terms of big plays, right? And what this might be able to open up underneath for him a little bit. So there is that. It's about more than Amari Cooper, right? It's because, in my opinion, it's what it does for everybody else and the roles it kind of puts them in that makes this offense all the more dangerous. No, I don't think he could be more spot on than that. I mean, one of the one of the secrets of coaching is being able to figure out what your players can do and putting them putting them in a position to be successful, right? And when you saw this offense and all the quick stuff and the and the motion and all those things, that was that staff doing that. I mean, they understood they didn't have a guy that you could just line up out there and run go balls with the whole game. They had a they had a limited room as far as wide receivers go. Now, Amari Cooper shows up and takes that pressure off those other guys. I mean, Shakir was a guy that you could look at as a guy that could play outside and inside. Now, get him back inside, you know, pair him with Cooper, get him inside. Um, you know, I think Coleman and where he is at this point in the season, I think everybody should be happy. He emerged this weekend. He's made some plays. I mean, obviously, that touchdown that was called back, uh, that was a tremendous play. I mean, he's doing exactly what they said he was going to be. He's a strong physical receiver. Now, he did get snatched up by about 18 guys on that one catch he had, but that's okay. But um, that's not why we – that's not the skill set that we drafted him for. But you're 100% correct. I mean, you can't force you can't force these guys to do things they're not physically able to do. And now, all of a sudden, I think you'll see this week, after a whole week of practice, that playbook maybe, and Joe Brady put a few more wrinkles in mm -hmm. and get some things a little bit more open as as Cooper gets you know comfortable with this offense. Do you do you think? And I don't know where Adam was going to go next, but I want to <clears throat> explore this with you. With Cooper in there now, does this finally enable the Bills to unlock Dalton Kincaid? Do you think? Because we saw a little bit of it. I mean, he he had three catches last week, right. but two of them were big time plays that he had a right. third and 12 that he made a great catch on the sideline. And then the one that was down to the corner of the end zone, there was a, well, it was a great throw by Allen, but it was also a great play by Kincaid. That's Jerry. Last time we were on, I think I was talking about how I, I wasn't really overwhelmed right. by Dalton Kincaid yet. He hadn't done what we thought that the, you know, the, what the bills told us he was going to do. And I saw a little bit of that on Sunday. Um, do you think that that maybe is partially why with Cooper here, Kincaid was able to do what he did. No, I think you're right. I think it's a trickle down effect, right? I mean, when you when you scouted the Bills up until Amari Cooper's arrival, um, you know, you looked at two guys. You looked at Shakir and you looked at Kincaid. Those are probably the two most explosive, reliable receivers. Take those guys away and force the Bills to have to make plays with Mac Hollins or a rookie outside with Keon Coleman. Not saying those guys don't do good things. It's just it's a trickle down effect. So now with Cooper, that's going to free that coverage up off of Kincaid, and you'll probably see him have more room. You already saw it this weekend with with Coleman. I mean, it freed him up some. But you're 100 percent correct. I think that the scouting report now changes a little bit, and the emphasis can't be on just you know Shakir and and Kincaid, especially when when Khalil didn't play. Then it was really obvious that hey, we know they want to get Kincaid the ball. We're shutting him down and forcing him elsewhere. Um, with Cooper playing, now it's going to free those guys up. I think it's a great assessment. How about what we just talked about, the change in the dynamic, uh, Jerry, in the receiving core, with the balance of the run game that we've seen, with James Cook, you know, back healthy, Ray Davis. I mean, what he did the night of the Jet game and kind of the change of pace that he provides – uh, how much more dangerous do they become? Because they do have the ability, even though this past week the numbers didn't necessarily show it, but they have the balance that can keep opposing defensive coordinators guessing. And I guess um, your take on the run game as it relates to that in the sense of the balance and the unpredictability that gives the offense in general. I think a lot of the biggest thing, too, you're going to see, not just in running game, but I think you're going to see it free up Davis and, and Cooks even a little more in the passing game. Um, look at what the Bills did this weekend that we hadn't seen in 
gosh knows how long. They they actually were successful running a couple screens. Mm -hmm. And usually it's hard to run screens when you've got that line of scrimmage packed with guys because you're running these little short routes and underneath stuff. And now all of a sudden just one guy changes the dynamic. You create space in that flat outside. And if you're looking at other teams, how they attack us right now, that's where they're attacking us outside in that D gap area, that flat area, the way we play defense, it's hard to cover that area for us. And now all of a sudden with Cooper coming in, you can get vertical, you can create more space. So yeah, I think that, you know, cause there was a lot of, you know, the slow start this weekend and then a lot of him and hawing about we're just running up the middle every time. Well, actually it's not up the middle as John Fina likes to point out it's between the tackles, right? It's not necessarily up the middle, but you know, when you look at the bills, I think, you know, if I can get two yards or three yards and all of a sudden it's third and five or less, then I feel a lot better than trying to force the ball in, in situations where maybe we don't have the guys that can, can make plays. So I think you're right. I mean, cooks and Davis are going to free. I love Davis. I mean, I haven't been this excited about a running back in a long time as I am about him. I mean, and it was funny when he comes in the game and all of a sudden we start hitting runs. It, it wasn't the fact that Davis is any better than Cooks. It's just a different style of runner. If you watch Cooks run, he's a hezzy step guy. He likes to kind of hesitate a bit. He'll find his spot, put it in the ground and go. He's more of a true blue zone runner, kind of like Thurman was. Then you bring in Ray Davis and there is no – hesitation it's one step and downhill and when like tennessee you got these two monstrous inside that guys this three technique and one technique that are probably 350 plus it's a lot better if you're downhill quick because it's harder for them they're not as not as quick getting off blocks but when they do they eat up a ton of space so i think that change up helped that running game but but no i think you're you're right i mean for a while now it's been stop the run get these guys in third down. And if you look at the numbers, the Bills have not been great in third down this season after last season being one of the better teams in the league. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully Cooper helps write that statistic. Hey, hey Jerry, I want to, I want you to put your former offensive lineman hat on. Um, whenever I talk to Ross Tucker, he, I mean, he loves talking about offensive line. That's what, that's what his thing is. And he watches every team's offensive right. line. It's insane. So I know you're paying attention to the Bills offensive line we know about Brown and Dawkins, what they can do. Can you kind of take me into the middle? And what do you think of the three interior guys? How do you think? Because that was where the talk, that was where all the talk was and all the concern was in the middle of the line this year with the three guys. What have you seen so far from, from McGovern, Torrance, and Edwards? I think um, what you have, you have some different styles. And I'll, I'll start with McGovern because before the season, that was my biggest concern was, was them moving Mitch Morris and now bringing McGovern in. And McGovern is a guy that's tall. He's longer. He's a good athlete. He's probably a better second level guy than he is a first level guy. He's athletic enough and long enough to make a lot of uh, tougher blocks inside. Uh, you know, as you know, as a center, you got to snap the ball. So you're going to start blocks with your hand between your legs. Mm -hmm. So it takes some skill and some different things to learn. And that length that he has allows him to make some, some tough reach blocks and some one-on-ones and things like that. I would say, I would say McGovern plays center more in a style of Kent Hull than like when I played center. I was a uh, put a nose guard on me. I'm going to fight, you know, fight you in a phone booth and and those types of things. So I think he's more of a Kent Hull type center. The guards are interesting. I think I think that Torrance, um, he's he's hit and miss a little bit. He's having some when he has issues. It's usually technique wise, but damn, is he strong and he's big. And when he puts his hands on you, you usually don't go anywhere. He's a true blue road grader type of guard, and he's a great pairing with Brown because that gives you a power side of the line of scrimmage. Edwards, he struggles sometimes. He's a bit of a bit of a journeyman. He's a guy that maybe has some issues with some with some strength guys, some bigger guys cause him some issues sometimes. But again, he's another dude that runs really, really well. He's longer. He moves good in space. So they all complement each other. And I was nerved up about taking McGovern away from left guard because I thought he did a pretty good job last year, moving to center because now you're changing two spots. But so far, up into uh, up to this season, the, the the line has has played pretty well. They have their moments, but the thing that I like about them the most is like Dion and Brown. They've got a little something in their neck, right? Mm -hmm. And although the NFL tries to neuter dogs in this league, and when I say dogs, I would D A W G S. You know, like Spencer Brown the other night gets the 15-yarder for finishing that block. Um, back five, ten years ago, that wasn't called. That was expected. 
and you know Dion what he has his his goings on with the Jets. I have no problem with it now. I wish we weren't getting fifteen yard penalties, but you need that in that offensive line because that's your leadership group on offense. As much as you like to you know, focus on quarterbacks and vocal receivers and all these different things. You got nastiness up front. You're going to be able to play on offense. And we've seen what this team is capable of really on both sides of the ball when they're able to control the line of scrimmage. And that's kind of a mantra for Sean McDermott and many other uh, NFL coaches. But it's a question, Jerry, that I've gotten numerous times this season, especially after this last game, it kind of, you know, reverberated again from, members of this fan base. You probably get it. I know Sal does. What's up with the slow starts, <laughs> right? And I'm interested uh, from a former player's perspective. I mean, I think you would have a unique uh, view on that based on experience and between the, the players on the field and, and the co- look, the coaches have shown a great ability to adjust and to their credit, but they do get them size, themselves behind the eight ball a little bit to start in these games. And I'm, I think that's something they're probably going to need to get corrected as the season goes on. I, you know, there's a lot of theories to what, what goes on with this. And this is my theory, whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent. Um, We, you know, offense coordinators tend to have a script, right? And they got their 10 to 12 plays and they script them out and they practice them in practice. And then when they come out, you know, they're going to go down the script unless there's something crazy happens where they got to get off of it, you know, and they're, they're very religious to that. Now, I don't know what Joe Brady does. I'm not familiar with how he does things as far as game planning goes. But I believe our quarterback, he is one of the, you know, when I say odd duck, I mean, I think it's why he gets so much criticism because nobody knows, you know, we're big in the NFL. We're we're comps. He comps is Jerry Rice. He comps is Thurman. He comps, you know, we want to have a comp. And, And there is no comparison for Josh Allen. I mean, he's, he's a unicorn. And I really, truly believe he thrives in chaos. Mm-hmm. He loves chaos. Mm-hmm. When, when some of his biggest games are when things are going crazy. I think – I would like to see Joe Brady do a little bit more with him. And I think teams are on defense are understanding this and trying to take it away, which makes it hard. Man, I'd run them in the first three plays. I might run them the first play. I, you, there's got to be something to get him going because it's almost like the slow starts are more him – than anybody else. I mean, you know, he likes to throw it downfield and take chances. He's now in a harness type of offense where it's quick throws, controlled throws. Maybe Cooper coming on another week of practice frees that up. Um, you know, but I think some of the slow starts are just him, and some of it is still his his willingness or maybe not willingness or stubbornness to really embrace what's going on because this is an offensive structure that. I don't think if you ask Josh, what do you want to run? He would necessarily run. But with the head coach preaching the two words of complimentary football, every chance mm-hmm. he gets and trying to make sure his defense is never put in a super bad position. If he can help it, um, he doesn't want that downhill or downfield, you know, circus throws or whatever he calls hero ball or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I think some of the slow starts are just 17 trying to, in his mind, embrace what he's doing and then getting into the flow of things and, you know, and moving on. I personally think this weekend slow start had to do with Monday night, Meadowlands, you beat your divisional rival short week. To me, it was more human nature than anything because they came out in the second half and decided to play and just absolutely shut them down. Let me ask you this because we, everyone talks about halftime adjustments, right? I mean, every media guy will ask McDermott after the game, halftime adjustments. What did you guys do? I'll never forget, Jerry, and I know you heard it a million times. Marv Levy used to tell us, (laughs) all this halftime adjustment stuff, guys, there's nothing to that. We have our game plans. At halftime, the guys come in, take a leak, towel off, do whatever, and they go back out. You were in the locker room. How much actually is adjust? Because everyone talked about Sunday. Oh, what great adjustments they made. They blew them out 27 zip in in the second half. You were in the locker room. What happens? Is Are there halftime adjustments actually being made? There's a few things, not a ton of stuff. I mean, you, they might be running a certain blitz that you change the way you protect it. Um, you might run a route different or add a route because of the way they're playing coverage. Defensively, same thing. If they're killing you in a certain gap, you might play it a different way. 
But no, I mean, it's not this revolutionary. We come in and draw up a whole bunch of stuff on the board and we change the game plan. And all of a sudden, you know, especially now, I mean, nowadays there should be no halftime adjustments because instead of looking at little still photos on a piece of paper, you got iPads, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's watching the game as it happens. (laughs) So, I mean, you should be able to adjust accordingly, but there was big adjustments this weekend. The only adjustment was attitude adjustment. And they finally got upset and said, you know what, we're going to go play. And the D line all of a sudden, instead of being knocked two yards back, was now playing two yards on the other side of the line of scrimmage. And the O line started, you know, changing the line of scrimmage. And I, I'm a firm believer with this Bills team right now. That's where the that's where the success is. Um, if we play well up the middle on defense and we play well in the offensive line, we always got a chance. I mean, we got to we got we got to control the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. All right, so lastly here, and as we record this, it's Tuesday. We'll see what the story is with uh, Terrell Bernard. Uh, Hopefully, fingers crossed with his ankle situation. We'll begin to learn more about that as they return to practice on Wednesday, getting ready for the Seattle Seahawks uh, this Sunday out on the Pacific Northwest. And and Sal and I uh, wrapped up our postgame report. Uh, This Seattle team, you know, convincing win over the Atlanta Falcons, four and three, definitely one that you don't want to sleep on. Heading yeah. out there, as Spain, we talk about the slow starts and, and all of that. And so, just an initial take on this matchup what strikes you about this matchup uh, with Seattle? Well, I think Seattle's always going to be a tough physical team. They've been that way for quite some time now. I mean, back in the day, they weren't necessarily that way. But since, you know, Pete Carroll was there and then they move on and McDonald's there now, uh, they're going to play a certain brand of defense in Seattle. They're going to get after you, they're going to try to get after you up front on offense. So, the Bills are going to have to be ready for a physical game. Um, it also would irk me a little bit that the one team that we totally got embarrassed by, um, the head coach of Seattle is their former D coordinator. So I would imagine, <laughs> don't think there isn't going to be any, uh, information trading between those two, um, mm-hmm. for this week as well. So that'll be something that'll be, uh, interesting to watch at, you know, what or look at, but you know, Buffalo, Buffalo to me, Week in and week out, I don't know how you guys feel. And we we talk about matchups. I knew that the Baltimore game was going to be tough for them because the way we try to play defense and match up against their big people just does not does not fit very well. But you know, to me, this Buffalo team's about themselves. Um, yeah. They're their own worst enemy. I mean, when they show up and and play, they're tough to beat. When they show up and they try to sleepwalk through the first half like they did this week, they're pretty normal. They're pretty mortal. And um, so that's what I would be concerned about more than anything. How does the team handle flying across the country? I don't know when they're leaving, if they if they still do the whole day early thing or they just go, you know, or two days early or whatever they do. We kind of did a little bit of both. But um, it'll be interesting to see how they how they show up. But to me anyway, and, you know, I think Seattle is a, is a formidable opponent. Now, obviously, their quarterback is hit and miss. You never know what you're going to get. But they've got the, you know, they got Metcalf. They got some playmakers on offense. They're they're going to be tough to play in an extremely loud stadium. Mm-hmm. The Seattle fans get after it. The twelfth man gets after it. So, really, to me though, again, it's 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 Josh Allen. It's the Bills team is themselves. I mean, how do they show up? Hey, you mentioned Metcalf. You know, there's there's question about whether he's going to play this week because he got hurt. Um, you know, there was one report that he's going to be week to week. And then like 20 minutes later, he's going to try his best to play. Who the hell knows what's going to happen. But I wanted to ask you, he's a great player. So as the bills prepare this week, let's say last, when you were playing, there was a great nose tackle that was up in the air. You didn't know what's the, what's the mentality, Jerry, as you're going into it, like for a guy like Benford and Douglas at cornerback, do we have to face Metcalf? What's the mentality of that when you're not quite sure what you're going to see? you practice like he's going to be there because he probably is. Um, you always practice that way, no matter what. It's just like last week, you know, they, they find out later in the week that, that Mason Rudolph was, was going to start, you know, they probably prepared for Levis, but you know, these guys, unlike college and, and, and high school, I mean, they're in there all day long. They'll figure it out, but no, you always prepare for the best that they have. And if, if DK Metcalf couldn't play, that would be wonderful for us. I mean, he's a tremendous player. He's a guy that, he does very, he, he runs, he runs good routes and has success against his own, which we like to run. So it'll be interesting to uh, how we match up. But I will say this. And I said this on our show this Sunday. I don't know how you guys feel about this. I mean, quietly, 
I think we have one of the top cornerback tandems in the league right now. Oh, yeah. I don't think um, it's Christian quiet. Redford, I don't think it's Douglas. quiet, Jerry. I think oh, we know. We'll agree on that. Yeah, I mean, my goodness. Those two just show up. And to think you got Benford in the seventh round from Villanova, you know, go Cats. And then you got you got another guy who his team was willing to get rid of him, and it was the sec he was traded by the Eagles as well. Yeah. And now they they're they're cornerstone corners in the NFL, just killing it. I mean, this we're we're lucky to have both those guys. Did you see the, the play that Benford made? Right, Hamlin makes the interception; he gets the glory. Did you see the play Benford made? Right. I mean, that was a quick in, and Benford just ate it up, and he's the guy who actually deflected the ball, and Hamlin got the pick. But that was yeah. all Benford on that play. It was a great play. Oh, yeah. And the yes. other thing, I, you, go ahead, Adam. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say Sal has referred to, and we've talked about it on this show, uh, that 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 duo as being among the best cornerback combinations. I think you got DJ Reed and Sauce Gardner, and you got these two guys. That's yeah. what I see in the NFL right now is the two best, the, the, the best tandem on the outside in the league. And the thing about them is, and I, one of the things I look at at cornerbacks is their willingness to put their face in there in a the running game. They play contain in the run. They are willing to tackle. They're great tacklers. And the way they are physically, they have durability to them. So just they're reliable and they're 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 playing trem- at a tremendously high level. And it's it's good for us because we understand the deficiencies in the safety room. So it's nice that we have that to kind of take away from some, you know, cover up for some of that until we get that safety room back where it needs to be. I'll tell you what, this week they're going to need to be good because even if Metcalf <laughs> doesn't play, you still got to right. worry about Jackson uh, Smith, the Najib, Najiba, I think it is. Yes, and, yes. and Lockett's still a great, Lockett's yes. been there for 10 years. He's still a great player. And yep. say what you want about Gino, who I've never believed in or crying out loud. He's having yep. the last three years. He has really played at a terrific maybe even top 10 quarterback level in the league the last three years. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, that's what I was saying earlier. He's, he, he's, he's something else. I mean, you know, he's, he's still going at it. And it's funny as usually there's no decline. It's he's getting better as he gets older, but you know, Lockett, of course, I've got a lot of love for, he's one of about 62 of them in the city of Tulsa. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's a, he's a Booker T uh, Washington grad. They're all Tulsa guys. So we, uh, we know them and pull for them, but obviously not this week. All right, Bills an early three-point favorite in that matchup Sunday again out in uh, Seattle. Bills uh, at five and two, Seahawks at uh, four and three. So just a couple of things before we wrap this up here, Jury. Overreaction Buffalo, powered by Believe. Tell us about your show, your work, and how people can check it out. Yeah, so we, uh, myself and John Fina, another former player, obviously first-rounder from Arizona, and uh, Joe Miller, we started this year uh, the Overreaction uh, Buffalo Sports Network obviously powered by believe and we're running shows all week long. We've got, uh, we've got our, uh, off tackle show, which is John's show. They, uh, spotlight offensive line on Mondays, Tuesdays, which is tonight, which is our on the beach show. We'll have on Joe Marino from uh, locked on bills. And then, uh, Wednesday night, we've got a couple of shows and Thursday night. We, um, we have my show, which is a big O show. We do a preview about the upcoming opponent. And then, uh, Fridays, uh, we have, uh, these walls could talk, talk about old school bill stuff. And obviously, like you guys, we do our uh, our uh, post game show as well on whichever you know whichever day the Bills play. So it's busy, but it's a lot of fun, and I'm really really enjoying it. And the uh, listenership's been great; they've been very supportive. Awesome. All right, outstanding work, outstanding. The second thing we have to do is wish <laughs> Sal a happy birthday. <laughs> oh, really, Sal? Yeah, we're not going to sing to you, man. That's okay. But if yeah, you thought this was going to pass quietly, it's not. 62 well, Sal, friggin' years old, Jerry. Can you believe that? <laughs> I'm 54, man. I'm getting yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not quite to where you are. <laughs> but I have to say, Sal, and I said this off the air. I fully, uh, unlike some people, I fully appreciate your all-in mentality about the Yankees oh, yeah. and the <laughs> fact that about three to four hours a night you can be absolutely miserable, just like me <laughs> when I follow my team. So yep. welcome to the welcome to uh to the club. That's the way yeah. it is, man. When you're <laughs> you're a fan of a team, look, I'm not a sports writer. Everyone, everyone mixes this up too. Yes. Well, how could you be a journalist and yes. be such a lunatic? I'm not a journalist when I'm watching the Yankees. I'm the fan, just <laughs> like you are. You're right. I'm going to be as much a nutbag as the rest of you guys are. So that's, that's like, what I do. It's like one time I was I was grinching at Reimersman in the huddle because he dropped the pass, and I think I was starting him on my fantasy team. I was like, "Come on, bro." <laughs> 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 and and Jerry, I'll say this: as a kid who grew up in the Boston area, I was a you know kind of a Red Sox fan and been scarred by 
you know, between 78 and 86, uh, early right. in my youth. I'm amazed that Sal even agreed to do this podcast with me. Well, I think that's what we're missing. You guys need a podcast. <laughs> that's what we're missing. We need like a base. You two need to be doing a Yankees. It would just be wonderful. Well, you know, it, it would be nice if at one point they're both good at the same time because they haven't been right. good together <laughs> for like 20 years. True. Yeah. And I would be, if you're looking for a moderator, I'd be willing to moderate. Right. <laughs> You'd do a fine job as you do with everything. Jerry Ostrowski, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you. Thanks for the time. All right. So for Sal Marana, uh, I'm Adam Bedinian for Jerry Ostrowski. Thanks for being with us here on Leave in Bills. <laughs>